maybe that. I got two emails during the week, one from two mess two SMSs during the week, one from Norm saying, Tom and Michelle are up on the Gold Coast. Uh, bring the camera. And then about 20 seconds later, I got a message from Tom saying, We're up on the Gold Coast, bring the camera. <laughs> I don't know if it was just because they thought I'm old and I needed to be reminded. <laughs> Well, <clears throat> brethren, it's taken us 20 sermons to get through 10 chapters of Hebrews and to get to the passage that most people, I think, in the book of Hebrews, most people know the best, chapter 11, the famous faith chapter. My dad used to call this chapter the art gallery of the heroes of faith. So before we dive into the detail of this, perhaps the best known chapter of Hebrews, we need to step back and have a look at the broad picture and think about the role of faith. The first thing we must recognise is that Paul is not introducing faith as a new topic this late in the epistle. In the context of the argument about the law and especially about the temple, all of that argument is about faith and the law. It's about being saved by faith and being kept by faith and about guarding one's personal faith and testimony by being obedient to the word of God. It's about having faith in the first place and then living by faith and not going back to the law, sorry, and going back to the law and going back to the temple, Paul says to these people, is not living by faith. In chapter 10, verse 38, just before this chapter, Paul says, the just shall live by faith. Notice the order there, it's very important. The person who has an exercised faith in Jesus Christ is justified, is just in the sight of God. That just person who is just by position should continue to live his or her life by faith. It is an absurdity to say that I am saved by faith, but I am kept by works. Paul says we are saved by faith and we are kept by faith. Now Paul borrowed that phrase, uh, as he often does, from the Old Testament, from an obscure prophet in the Old Testament called Habakkuk. I'll give you the exact quote. Habakkuk says in chapter 2 verse 4, Behold the proud, his soul is not upright in him, but the just shall live by his faith. There's that classic Old Testament parallelism there the one thing set against another, to contrast the two things. The just shall live by faith, Paul says. And Paul will go on in this chapter with many, many examples to document its all-pervasive nature. Even a pervasive reading, even a cursory reading of the Gospel of John will show that Jesus was constantly exhorting his hearers, the people, the Pharisees, and his own followers to believe in him, to have faith in him, who he was, where he came from, what he taught. He constantly demanded faith. You must believe, he said. He pointed to the consequences of not exercising faith. Just two verses on from the famous John 3.16. In John 3.18, Jesus said, He who believes in him is not condemned. But he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. There's three uses of the word belief in one verse. Jesus is constantly preaching about faith. So Paul is not introducing a new teaching here. He is following the same line of argument that has pervaded and driven the entire epistle and is in fact consistent with the whole of the rest of Scripture, as many examples of the people of faith will follow. So what is he doing? Well, he's first of all defining faith, and then he's showing how faith has been demonstrated by examples from history. Faith, he says, is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen, or literally from the Greek. Faith is the realisation of things that are hoped for and the confidence of things that are not seen. Confidence is built on faith. Faith is the foundation stone of everything. By it, he goes on to say, the elders obtained a good testimony. The testimony of the respected and revered people of all of man's history and the respected and revered people of all of Israel's history was obtained by faith. Everywhere here, Paul will use the great works 
and great actions as examples, but they are all works of faith. He is going to go on to document this. I borrowed a phrase here from, from Luke. By many infallible proofs. Luke uses that phrase in the first couple of verses of the book of Acts. But first this. Verse 3. By faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. So that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. Now, I've spent the whole of my life defending and arguing and discussing the scriptures and often with people who either don't believe or in many cases don't want to believe what the Bible says about all sorts of things. If at any stage you've had occasion to discuss or argue with an evolutionist about origins and the like, you will certainly have been asked to provide proof for your point of view. Oh well, that's what you say, prove it. Despite the theory of evolution being supremely unscientific, its proponents like to take the high intellectual ground with you and demand that you prove your point of view while they themselves feel no responsibility to prove their point of view. I don't know if you've noticed that, um, but that's true. What is the answer? Well, clearly evolution cannot be proven because there's no written eyewitness record of the evidence and sequences of events which, to which it makes claim. We don't have a document from three billion years ago saying a little beast crawled up out of the ocean uh, and decided to grow wings and uh, become a bird and then become uh, an, an ape and then become man. There's no written record of that. It's all understood by looking back or it's all constructed by looking back. So, can sovereign creation, as taught here by Paul and the rest of the scriptures, can sovereign creation be proved? Well, we can say rightly that the word of God uh, is God's eyewitness account of the beginning of all things. Who is the only person who was around when the world was created? Well, God was the only person around when the world was created. And we as Christians believe that God told Moses what to write in Genesis chapter 1. So Genesis chapter 1, the creation narrative, is God's eyewitness account of the stuff that he did when he did it. <coughs> and we're correct in saying that. But as with evolution, providing no proof actual proof of its claims so there is no way of proving creation outside of the description of it in the Bible now let me be very careful here in case you misunderstand what I'm saying I don't want you to do that the Bible says the heavens declare the glory of God the firmament shows his handiwork all over the world we find proof for the events in the world's history that are described in the Bible we find evidences in geology in cosmology and in anthropology. The Grand Canyon in the United States, just for an example, is 100% more likely to have been formed in a few days in the cataclysmic events of the flood than over millions of years by the slow, lazy Colorado River. To look for a less obvious answer than the abundantly obvious answer is to deny the obvious for unscientific reasons. We're not happy with the logical answer. Let's find one that isn't. That's the evolutionist position when it comes to that particular thing and many, many other things. The world of the cosmos and the physical planet is scarred by events which took place in 1500 BC at the time of the Exodus. Now, we look at the Exodus and we see the, the uh, Passover and the coming out of the children of Israel. But at that stage of proceedings, in 1500 BC, the world passed through some pretty cataclysmic times that the Bible only documents with reference to what happened in Egypt. But plenty of scientists will show you that there are places all around the world that show the same sorts of scars of the things that happened in Egypt that happen in other places, even in as far away as the Americas. Not only Egypt was affected by the plagues and disasters of that year and a bit, while God sorted out the intransigent Pharaoh. Skeptics in the 19th century denied the story of Joseph, of Jonah. Oh, that's all rubbish, you know. Jonah swallowed by a fish? Nah, that can't be right. And anyway, where's this Nineveh that he talked about? It was supposed to be one of the great cities of the Near East. Well, back in that time when those things were being said, cities that were known now to be Bible cities were being dug up all the time. But no one had found Nineveh. Well, the story of Jonah can't be true because no one's found Nineveh. And then one day someone was digging in the side of a hill on the banks of the Tigris River in modern-day Iraq and found that it wasn't a hill at all. 
it was actually the city of Nineveh. It had been covered by thousands of years of mud and earth and debris. And when it finally was restored, they found that this city was so big that the walls were so wide that you could drive two chariots abreast along the top of the walls of the city. So any question about Jonah and Nineveh? Well, the city's certainly there. You can go and look at it today if you want. It's in the place of... It's now part of the city of Mosul uh, in, in, uh, in Iraq. One of the great archaeologists of the day was quoted as saying, every time we turn over a piece of earth, we find further proof of the Bible stories. <laughs> and we could go on and multiply examples. But when we come to discussing the beginnings of the planet and the universe, we now seek to examine and understand there is no evidence... Evolution has none. Evolution, in fact, falls at the very first hurdle by failing to answer where the stuff came from that precipitated the infamous Big Bang and following. Charles Darwin himself, with patent dishonesty, said, I'm not going to discuss the concept of a first cause. I want to start on the second rung of the ladder, if that's all right with you. We'll talk about things that happened with stuff that was already there. And if you ask an evolutionist, where did the stuff that was already there come from, they won't answer you because they don't have an answer. Only the Bible provides an answer for a time when there was nothing and then all of a sudden there was something. The evolutionist has no answer for that. The Bible provides no proof of origins either. Paul says what Christians believe about origins is apprehended by faith. Now I've had... 50 odd years of arguments and discussions with evolutionists. I'm kind of a bit of a professional when it comes to that sort of thing. I don't know, I just seem to have a little sign on my head that says, come and argue about evolution with me, you know? <laughs> because it happens all the time, I've got to tell you. But I can tell this, it requires as much faith to be an evolutionist as it does to be a creationist. Because there ain't no evidence for it. Paul says here, that it is by faith that we understand that the ages were framed by the word of God. <coughs> it is by faith that we understand that the ages were formed, the worlds were formed by the word of God. Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. Paul says, we believe that God spoke and it was. Here he's echoing the words of the psalmist, 33, 6 to 9. The psalmist says, by the word of the Lord the heavens were made and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. He gathers the waters of the sea together as a heap. He lays up the deep in storehouses. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. For he spoke, and it was done. He commanded, and it stood fast. There's the first cause. There's the first cause. Now, some dishonest so-called Christian people say, well, we can accept that, but then we slot evolution in as a follow-on. No, you don't. No, you don't. You can. But it's scientifically dishonest and it's theologically unsustainable. And we can discuss that at a later date if you want. This and Paul's we believe is a theological statement, not a scientific statement. It marks in both cases the fact that the psalmist and Paul, and in fact all the Old Testament writers, were solid creationists. Jesus was a solid creationist. Jesus constantly spoke about God creating the world. There is no message, there is no mention, there is no hint at any other source of the world and the universe in the whole of the scriptures except to say, in the beginning, God created. The Bible is based upon that template. Furthermore, I could say, anthropologically speaking, all the races that have lived and are living on the face of the earth link the earth's existence and their own to the hand of God or their gods. Now you can go and search all the religions of the world, you'll find right when you get back to it, where did it all come from? Our gods did that. Even the Australian Aboriginals say that the, that the, the, the land was created by the Great Spirit. That's a creationist point of view. That is not an evolutionary point of view. That's a creationist point of view. The facts are wrong, but the concept is 100% correct. Evolution is an invention of relatively modern man concocted to deny the biblical record and eons of belief of all the races of the earth. Do you find it at all surprising that all the races of the earth believe that God created because that goes back to the common ancestry of Adam who God created? 
So you can never win an argument with an evolutionist <clears throat> because both sides, his and ours, are arguing on the basis of faith. Not a factual basis. Don't bother. Just say, well, that's what you believe, with emphasis on belief. This is what I believe. I believe what I believe because God's Bible says so. You believe what you believe because some man has said it. And often, in these sorts of discussions, that has to be the end of it. Because you'll then get an endless parade of yes, but, yes, but, yes, but, that's time to walk away. That's time to walk away. Because it's not about facts, it's about faith. The next phrase in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 3, is also a theological statement. A theological statement. Please note. He says, So that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible, or things which do appear, the old AV says. It's important for us not to ascribe to this phrase some pre-Einstein knowledge of atomic theory on the part of the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul was not a scientist. He was a theologian. The Apostle Paul lived 2,000 years before the time when Einstein propounded atomic theory and that things in the world are made up of protons and neutrons and electrons, and as my brother's T-shirt rather wryly says at the bottom, and morons. Well, that's it. <laughs> Nevertheless, this statement does accord with what we now know about the structure of the world. Down to its component level. Paul says... God made everything that can be seen and experienced out of stuff that cannot be seen or experienced. That's the simple reading of the text. He made the building blocks, so to speak, and then he used the building blocks to make the rest. This is in accordance with what the psalmist said in 33. This is in accordance with what Genesis chapter 1 verse 1 says. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. But all of this knowledge ultimately is apprehended by faith. Ultimately, the creation-evolution debate is about having faith in one of two models of origin. The first one is, I was just walking along and wow, there it was, you know, the gold watch in the middle of the jungle. The second is, in the beginning, God created. We make our choice about which one of those two we place our faith in. So Paul says that we understand how we're here and why we're here, not by scientific method, but by faith. And then he goes on to document dozens of people in man's history and how they showed that they had faith. Verse 4, the case of Abel. By faith, Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and through it, he being dead still speaks. Now let's consult our theological GPS here for a moment. And let's get our bearings in the context of the, of the whole epistle and what argument Paul is trying to drive along here. Where are we and why are we here? Well, we're in Jerusalem. We're in about 50, 55, 60 maybe AD. We're amongst Jews who become Christians and who either are toying with the idea of going back to the law and the temple or, as I suggested to you last time, are being persecuted or bullied into going back to the temple. Come back to where you should be. Come back to where you really belong. This Christian thing is just an aberration. It'll pass in time. This is where the real story lies. Look, it's been going for 1,500 years after all. Paul has said for 10 whole chapters, don't do it. Don't do it. It might be older, but it isn't better. So why, in this quintessentially Jewish epistle, when talking about faith, why doesn't Paul start with Abraham? the father of the Jewish race. I've got the answer in my notes. Who's got an answer? Why doesn't Paul start with Abraham? Why does Paul start with Abel? Well, they're the first ones that they give offerings. The other two walk with God. Yeah. Adam and Eve. Yeah, yeah. They knew God. Right. David, what are the lines on that? They're so basically the same thing. We're starting at the beginning. We're starting at the beginning. All right. Abraham is undoubtedly a man of faith. And Paul spends four or five verses talking about him. He gets his fair mention. But Abraham is not the first man of faith. Paul says faith, by starting with Abel, faith is not a Jewish attribute. Faith is a universal attribute. You can see how this feeds back into don't go back to the temple. 
Paul's saying long before that, okay, it's 1,500 years old, long before that, Abel exercised faith in God. Before there was a temple, before there was a covenant, Lewis? That whosoever believeth. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. It's got nothing to do with race. It's got nothing to do with race in this context. It's got nothing to do with race in any other context. So what do we know? Abel. Cain and Abel were Adam and Eve's first two children in that order. Cain is the firstborn. Abel is the secondborn. They were born after the fall, obviously. Cain and Abel were born after Adam and Eve had sinned and been cast out of the Garden of Eden. There is no timeline in these chapters. We don't know how long it was between when Adam and Eve sinned and were cast out of the Garden and these two sons were born. But clearly they were both adults at the time they offered the offering, so they might have been 18, 20 years old. So time has passed in between Adam and Eve living in the Garden and the fall and then the birth of these two boys. We don't know what spiritual knowledge Adam and Eve had. How quickly the knowledge of being holy and perfect and living in fellowship with God had become degraded by the realities of sin that they had entered into. We don't know how quickly all that had happened. But it seems that from somewhere, both these men, Cain and Abel, knew that it was appropriate to offer offerings to the Lord. And so they did. Cain's offering, we read, is from the fruit of the ground. This is Genesis chapter 4 and verse 3. Abel's offering is a sacrifice of a lamb from his flock. Very simple. Now much is implied here, and some assumptions that have been made by some preachers and scholars are simply unsustainable. Let's try and see just what the text says. It's not valid to teach as some do that, they were, that these were the first ever offerings made to God by man. The Bible doesn't say that. <laughs> The Bible does not say that, but the Bible doesn't say that. Given that these men are now 20 years old, it's highly unlikely. It's highly unlikely that on this morning, these two men both got up and both said at the same time, you know what, I'm going to make an offering to God today. That would be a neat new idea, wouldn't it? That just doesn't kind of work, does it? It's also highly unlikely that there, were all, that there was already a knowledge shared by only four human beings on the planet that a blood sacrifice was acceptable to God, but a grain offering was not. Many scholars make great play about the differences between the two offerings. Now, we read that God clothed the naked Adam and Eve with the skins of animals. And that implies, of course, the death of the animal that supplied the skins, unless God miraculously created them. The Bible says neither one way or the other. But either way, the narrative nowhere says or even implies that God then went on and taught Adam and Eve that they were to continue to do this. The Bible doesn't say it. Of grain offerings, remember, Cain offered the fruit of the field. Of grain offerings, we do well to remember that two of the offerings that were commanded by God later in the law were grain offerings. So God is not inherently opposed to grain offerings and exclusively demanding of blood sacrifice. So that argument collapses. No, the problem lies not in the actual elements of the offering, but what? The thoughts behind In the it. attitudes of the heart of the two men. Right? The attitude of heart of the two men. We read the Lord... Re this is in, this is in, uh, in uh, Genesis chapter 4. The Lord respected Abel and his offering but he did not respect Cain and his offering. Now, I don't want to put too much weight on the actual wording because, remember, we're looking at an English translation of a Hebrew text, okay? So we're not going to be too demanding of the language here. But it seems fairly clear here that God looked at the heart of both men and made his judgment based on their attitudes and how these attitudes were reflected in what they offered. So the attitude of the heart is the determining factor of God's response, the offering that is offered is an indication of the attitude of these men's hearts. You with me on this? So God is not judging solely or even primarily on the substance of the offering. God respected Abel and his offering, but not Cain and his offering, we read. Both offerings... Some scholars say, well, of course, uh, an animal sacrifice is much more valuable than a grain sacrifice. Says who? 
both offerings were renewable. The ground would bear more grain. It would be replaced. The sheep would breed again. The animal would be replaced. There's nothing intrinsic about the actual offering. God saw the faith of Abel reflected in his offering, but saw no such faith in Cain. Now God has an argument with Cain about this situation because Cain's angry because Cain says, why have you accepted his offering and not mine? Well, if you ask God for an explanation, you can be sure he'll probably give it. You may not like it, but he'll probably give it. Cain picks a fight with God and says, not fair. You know, why is my offering any worse or any better? Why is my offering worse? God has a very simple answer to Cain. He says in verse 7, If you do well, will you not be accepted? Again, the problem is not the offering, but Cain's heart. God goes on to say to this man, listen to these words, If you do well, if you do not well, sin lies at the door. Its desire is for you, but you should rule over it. What's God doing? God's not saying, I'm less interested in your grain and more interested in Abel's grain. God's saying, I'm more interested in what's going on in your heart as opposed to what's going on in Abel's heart. Cain makes no attempt to obey the command of God and amend the attitudes of his heart. He kills his brother in retaliation because he can't kill God for his righteous words. God's actual judgment falls on him and he's banished from Adam's family, still carrying with him Adam's sin. Remember Paul says in Romans 5.12, by one man sin entered into the world and death by sin and so death passed on all men for all have sinned. Now Abel's a sinner too. okay? But Abel offers an offering which reflects the faith in his heart. Faithful Abel is replaced by another son, Seth, who also has a son called Enosh. Chapter 4 of Genesis ends with these words. Then men began to call on the name of the Lord. The pattern for worship had been set by Abel, the first man of faith, and is followed by all the people of faith after. Now, I'm not going to go by without answering that question. You know that question? That question? Yeah. <laughs> You know, you're preaching in the open air and someone comes along and says, ah, oh, the Bible's all full of roast. How do you know that? Well, the Bible says Adam and Eve had two sons, Cain and Abel, and Cain killed Abel. Where did Cain get his wife from? Right? <clears throat> Dr. Nicholson used to say, I can't tell you, I'm not Abel. <laughs> <laughs> but just to answer that question, let me say, chapter 5, the genealogies in, in Genesis, they're not exactly sparkling reading, but you should read them. Okay, yeah. chapter 5 tells us that Adam and Eve, after they had Seth, when Adam was 130 years old, Adam and Eve, Adam lived for another 800 years, and the Bible said, had sons and daughters. As a famous preacher used to say, if Cain couldn't get a wife from that many female offspring, he was too hard to please by half. So that's the end of that discussion straight away. So Abel creates unwittingly the enduring template of faith. It is to have a heart that desires to please God and to have that heart show by its actions the faith that it has. Plainly, Cain did not. And that the Abel template is to worship God to the limit of of one's abilities. Now the next person that Paul brings up is Enoch. Again, it's difficult to track through time in the genealogies, but time has passed from Abel, and the next person who's mentioned is a person of faith, and his name is Enoch. Now one day, many, many years ago, actually it was 1982, I remember it exactly, I could take you to the spot where I did it, I stuck together a whole long piece of paper I've still got it at home. It's nearly falling apart now, stuck together with sticky tape. And I went through the Old Testament and I drew to scale all the genealogies and all the names and dates that I could find that gave you names and dates in the Old Testament, <laughs> right up to 586 BC, the destruction of Jerusalem in Babylon. And when you read the genealogy in Genesis chapter 5, it says so-and-so begat so-and-so, and then he lived for so-and-so, and then he died. You need to understand that those genealogies overlap. They're not butted end to end. They overlap. 
and the next person overlaps, and the next person overlaps. Now, the, the distance, the variation of the overlap is variable. But the fact of the matter is, by the time you get to the end of Genesis chapter 5, most of the people in their genealogy are alive just before Adam dies. Okay, so these things, these things overlap. So we don't exactly know how many years. I could probably look at. I could probably tell you exactly if I could dig the piece of paper out from somewhere. Okay, but here we have a situation now where years certainly down from a down from Abel, Enoch is born. The Bible tells us by faith Enoch was taken away so that he did not see death, and he was not found because God had taken him. Now we find him in this genealogy. Here in verse 21 of chapter 5 of Genesis we read, Enoch lived 65 years and begat Methuselah. What's Methuselah famous for? No, He's the world's oldest man. 969 years Methuselah lived. Nearly made it to a thousand. After he, that is Enoch, begot Methuselah, Enoch walked with God 300 years and had sons and daughters. So all the days of Enoch were 365 years and Enoch walked with God and he was not for God took him. Now, again, we must be aware of reading things into the text that aren't there or making assumptions. Let's just stick to the facts and see what we come up with. <laughs> Firstly, Enoch begat Methuselah at a very young age by comparison with the rest of the patriarchs who I mentioned. Enoch's father lived for 162 years before Enoch was born. Enoch lived for just 65 years before Methuselah was born. Secondly, while the phrase and had sons and daughters is common to that genealogy, the phrase Enoch walked with God is unique to that genealogy. Now we need to be very careful what spiritual weight we place upon the people in this genealogy. But let me say that all of these people are righteous people and the end of the genealogy is Noah who is a man, who is a righteous man, who God says is a righteous man, is the last righteous man left before God destroys the world. So there's no question that there's any variation of righteousness or anything. All these people are people who are in the line that God is going to use to bring to bar the Lord Jesus Christ. All these men are accredited as being righteous. So there's every reason to accept too that these people were righteous. Why then does it specifically document Enoch as walking with God? Because that's unique in the whole genealogy. Why does it just say of Enoch if these other people were righteous? Why does it just say of Enoch that Enoch walked with God? Now, as with many things in the scriptures, we don't know the answer to that question. We don't know. We do not know that if the birth of his son Methuselah triggered some desire in Enoch for a closer relationship with God that he previously not had. Some commentators suggest that that is the case. Some commentators suggest, in fact, that Enoch was a pagan until he had his son and then he decided to walk with God. That's not sustainable from Scripture. The Bible just says that after the birth of his son, he lived for another 300 years, had sons and daughters, and walked with God. That's all it says, and that's all we're allowed to say. We can at least assume I feel safe in saying that the pattern of worship of God begun by Abel was well established by this stage and that Enoch probably followed that pattern. So he lived for 365 years and then, what does it say? God took him. <clears throat> now this is not a euphemism for death. Because all these other people died. So and so lived for so many years and had a son and he lived after the birth of his son for so many more years and he died. That's the litany of the passage. One man stands out in the passage. He lived for X a number of years and the Lord took him. So taking him is not a euphemism for death. Enoch is unique in all the genealogy and in all the human history except for one other man in that he did not die. God took him. He was not, or he was not found, is code for one moment he was there and the next moment he wasn't. Plain and simple. We get fanciful about all of that. It's not really necessary. But the fact of the matter is one day Enoch was just doing what he normally does and God says, right, let's go. And took him away from the earth. Just like that. 
We can also believe, I expect that since this was so unique, it was almost certainly unexpected. I don't think, no, Enoch was going, only a few more days to go. I think Enoch was just doing what a righteous man does from day to day as best as he could. And God said one day, you know something, I've been coming down to your place to visit with you. Why don't you come up to my place and visit with me? And Enoch disappeared off the face of the earth. He was walking with God from day to day. And one day God said, you know what, we can do this easier if we do it at my place. And came and took him away. Now it doesn't say so in Enoch's case, but you remember when God took Elijah away, the prophets all said, oh, he was taken up in a whirlwind, so they searched for about 30 days to try and find him because they figured the whirlwind had taken him up and eventually would drop him back down on the earth and they'd find his body. Needless to say, they didn't because he wasn't there. And he had told them, don't bother looking for me, you won't find me. Enoch just disappeared off the face of the earth. One day he was there, next day he was. So Enoch's faith receives the ultimate reward. He passes from this realm into the next without dying. It is not without significance that the Holy Spirit here inspires the Apostle Paul to insert verse 6 after documenting Enoch's faith. Without faith it is impossible to please God, to please him. For he that comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Even if Paul stopped Hebrews 11 right there, with just Abel and Enoch, that point is proven. These people believed that God was, and that they came to God believing that he was, and God rewarded their faith. Now, I don't know how long it's going to take to expound this chapter. I'm not in any particular hurry. I hope you're not. So, so many things to consider here. Faith is its own reward. Faith is its own reward. Faith is the realisation and confidence of everything that we do not yet know and what we do not yet understand. Faith helps, up, helps us to believe that God is and that he is a reward of those who diligently seek him. God is not pleased by logic or scientific analysis of who he may or may not be. He is only pleased by faith. He does not yield up his most precious secrets to the linguistic analysis of the text of the scriptures, but by faith in the scriptures and in him. Faith is older than and superior to religion, even the one that God gave to Israel. Abel believes that God is and is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him and as a sign of the faith that he has in his heart, offers an appropriate offering to God. His faith is rewarded, although he is killed by his brother. Abel is the first man of faith in the human race, and Paul reminds us, although this was a long time ago, he is still remembered for that. Paul says in verse 4, By faith Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and through it, he being dead still speaks. Before any formal religion exists on the earth, when only four people are breathing its air, and ages before God gave Israel his law at Sinai, relationship with God was attained and sustained by faith, not by works. Enoch, of course, is the prototype of the saints of the new covenant. Brethren, if you're here this morning, you're a saint of the new covenant. Enoch is your spiritual grandfather. As he walked with God and one day disappeared into heaven, so those who are people of faith in this current dispensation will likewise answer the call of Jesus and rise from this earth. The dead, resurrected, the living, like Enoch, without dying to meet the Saviour in the air. And so Paul reminds us, so shall we ever be with the Lord. Enoch is still with the Lord. One day, on exactly the same basis, if we are alive when the Lord Jesus Christ comes back, we will be taken to heaven in the same way that he and Elijah was. Perhaps not so dramatically, but certainly, well, as far as the world's concerned that's left, it's certainly going to be dramatic. Those who believe Paul's teaching on this in Thessalonians and, and Corinthians sustain their faith in the rapture with the example of Enoch and Elijah, people who walked with God and God took them. Just to reinforce the point, Paul's first two men of faith are men of no race and no formal religion. These men live 
thousand years, two thousand years before the giving of the law. But these men walk by faith and God justifies their faith. Their reward with God is not because of keeping of the law, which did not exist at that time, or observing the ceremonies and statutes of the temple, which did not exist at that time. Their reward is because they believe God was, God rewarded them for diligently seeking him. Their reward is the reward of faith. Paul says again to the wavering Jews, you don't need the temple to be accepted by God. You don't need the law, you don't need the law to leave this earth for heaven when Jesus comes. Just have faith and keep the faith. And so he goes on in the rest of the chapter. And we're certainly going to do that too because there's much to learn. But here Paul is saying a key crucial thing for all of us and especially for those Jews in Jerusalem. See that temple over there? Been there for 500 years. See that law you've had for 1,500 years. Here's a man who lived 2,000 years before the law who had faith and God rewarded him for diligently seeking him. Is it about law? Is it about the temple? No, it's always since the fourth human being on the face of this earth, it's always been about faith. <coughs> to have faith and to walk by faith. Let me pray. A gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you. Because nothing we could do would please you anyway. We're sinful human beings. The very best offering that we could give is still tainted by our sin. But we thank you, Heavenly Father, that you delight to have us come to you by faith. Because you are worthy of that faith. And you reward our faith. We thank you, Lord, that having put our faith in you, we have indeed been born again, not by any means except through the power of the Spirit of God and the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you, Lord, that you enable us day by day, despite being dragged around by the flesh, you enable us to live a life of faith and to continue to trust you for things that we don't understand. Things that we don't know are going to happen. But to have faith in you, to believe in you, and being rewarded because we diligently seek you. Heavenly Father, we pray that we might not move one millimetre away from the preciousness and centrality of faith. We thank you, Lord, for Paul so eloquently teaching these things. Help us, Lord, to understand them and to learn them and to jealously guard their truths. We pray this in our Lord Jesus Christ's name. Amen.